You know who you are? Steven is my name. Even Steven. Will you say something, Steven? Steven or else media. The following episode will contain references to stories and characters that may cause sudden and uncontrollable feelings of nostalgic joy and wonder. Listener discretion is advised. Here it is, folks. Close the box and find the fox. It's time for Event or Else, the podcast where I go through most every major Marvel and DC event, one issue at a time, so you don't have to. I'm your host. My name is Steven. And here we are back on the road again to talk about Marvel Superhero Secret Wars. This week, we're looking at issue number five, and it's entitled The Battle of Four Armies. This issue was published by Marvel Comics in September of 1984, and it was written by Jim Shooter with pencils by Bob Layton, inks by John Beatty, letters by Joe Rosen, and colors by Christy Scheel. The issue opens with Reed Richards, and he's none too happy. He suspected what Galactus has been up to, and now it seems that his fears have been proven true as the Planet Eater's world ship arrives. This ship is freaking huge. It's so big, it blots out the sky. It's even described by Spider-Man as being as big as a whole solar system. That's not really something my imagination can even fathom. So it's a good thing we have a picture of it. Anyway, the heroes, if you remember from the last issue, have bunked up in an alien village located in the shadow of Galactus. And the village healer, seeing such an impossible sight, freaks out. The Human Torch tries to calm her down, but he's finding it rather difficult due to the fact that neither one can speak the other's language. But the healer just might have a solution. She takes Johnny into her home and the two get high. Well, kind of. I mean, she does take him into her home and she opens a bottle of strange liquid and gas pours out of the top, filling the room. Then, as the two take the gas into their lungs they are suddenly able to see into each other's thoughts and experience each other's memories. This bit of storytelling allows us, the reader, to relive some of the big key scenes from the previous four issues, thus getting ourselves all caught up in case we may have forgotten. But here's the thing. It really does feel like the two are getting high. I mean, they're huffing fumes. They're hallucinating. It's the whole nine yards. Regardless, once they have peeked into each other's minds, Johnny learns the alien healer's name, Zashi, and the two commence to lip wrestling, smooching, making out, snogging, sucking face, kissing, or whatever you want to call it. Regardless, it's pretty gross. Meanwhile, far away within the fortress lair of Magneto, in a darkened chamber, the X-Men called Colossus wallows in an ocean of loneliness and worry. In other words, the boy misses his girl. Colossus is kicked back on an alien couch, and he's thinking about Kitty Pride, and he's just being all kinds of super emo about it. When his thoughts are cut short by a telepathic summons from Professor X, who appears at his side as a giant head, ah! which of course startles the crap out of Colossus so that he falls off the couch. Seconds later, the X-Men gather. Magneto is impressed by their speed in obeying the Professor's command. The Professor, however, feels that they were a bit slower than he's content with. I mean, there's just no pleasing this guy, apparently. Once they're all together, Magneto retracts the dome overhead so that the Professor can show them all why he's called them together. It is, of course, the world ship of Galactus, that has taken over the sky. The X-Men are suitably impressed. Magneto then commands the team to prepare a ship and stand by in case they're called on to move against Galactus. In the meantime, he and the Professor will attempt a more subtle approach. The X-Men push back. After all, Magneto ain't their leader. Storm is in command, not him. Professor X, however, tells the team that for the time being, he's going to be the one given the orders. And so they need to do what Magneto has requested. The team reluctantly agrees. 
At that moment, thousands of miles away at the massive fortress called Doom Base, Volcana and Molecule Man are really becoming quite chummy. They're out for a walk in the garden, and they come across the Absorbing Man, the Wrecker, and the Wrecking Crew, and almost immediately, Pile Driver starts hurling insults at the couple. He refers to Molecule Man as a milksop, and not only calls Volcana a cow, he actually goes, Moo! Volcana, feeling justifiably offended, is ready to throw down. Molecule Man, however, requests that they just walk away. His therapist, after all, has told him in the past not to react to such jibes. So, they turn the other cheek. But Volcana tosses a threat back at him, telling them that if one more sound comes out of them, she's going to make them sorry. Pile Driver, ever the mature diplomat, responds with, Yes, I'm Miss Nerd. Evening, Mr. Nerd. Well, that tears it. That word is enough to push Molecule Man over the edge, and he wants to know who said it. Volcana, it seems, is very much aware of who the verbal culprit is, because she's quick to slap a fresh one across Pile Driver's face. Pile Driver calls her a fat bag and throws a threat her way, but Molecule Man steps up telling him that Pile Driver isn't going to do anything. Pile Driver quickly finds himself alone as his companions turn their back on him, all of them being smart enough not to stand up to the Molecule Man, who commences to use his power over all molecules to change Pile Driver's costume into an ultra-hard metal so that the man can't move. And then Molecule Man pushes Pile Driver into the mud. Volcana, wanting to get her licks in, pushes Pile Driver's face deeper into the mud with her foot. Then, after making the others understand that they'll get a bit of the same if they mess with him, the Molecule Man creates a flying chariot out of solidified air molecules, and he and Volcana fly away. Titania, who has been watching the scene, proves that she's not all that bright by pulling a tree out of the ground as she calls the others cowards, saying she'd rip that twerp in half if he tried any of that with her. I'm not quite sure what she was planning on doing with the tree, because her tough talk suddenly trails off when she notices the giant spaceship taking up the sky. The others, after freeing Pile Driver, are all just as confused and scared, hoping that Doom will know what to do. Doom, in the meantime, is in his lab. Not only has he been expecting an appearance by the world ship, he's been waiting on it, as it's an integral part of his plan, which he can now put into motion. And so he sends out a broadcast to the other villains in typical Doom fashion. Attention, servitors of Doom. Prepare yourself for battle. From this instant on, you are all on red alert. You shall be ready to strike at a moment's notice. Fail me and you shall be utterly destroyed. The Enchantress chooses this moment to confront Doom. She's figured out Doom's plan and knows that there is only the slightest of chances that any of them will survive. And frankly, she's afraid. So she tries to bargain with Doom. She's been trying to use her magic to get her home, but something is blocking her. And she figures that with his help, Together, they can make it happen. She offers both herself and to fix his scarred face. She even drops to her knees and begs, but Doom's having none of it. He dismisses her and she leaves, telling him that he will regret his decision. Doom, however, doesn't seem all that concerned. Meanwhile, as Professor X tries to communicate with Galactus telepathically, the heroes in the alien village ponder their options. Mr. Fantastic tells Captain America that he once saved Galactus's life, and he feels that for that reason alone, Galactus may listen to him. Cap agrees, and Reed stretches up to have a talk with the World Devourer. But, try as he might, Reed can't manage to get the giant's attention. Meanwhile, Professor X continues to try to reach Galactus telepathically, using Magneto's brain power in an attempt to boost the signal. They get through just enough to annoy Galactus, who fires back with a psionic pulse powerful enough to destroy a bit of Magneto's fortress. Galactus, at this point, also notices Reed and forces him back with a telekinetic blast. Reed crashes back among the heroes and warns them that the giant has become aware of them, seeing them as pests 
and might possibly send some sort of exterminator their way, which, of course, he does in the form of a giant robot. The heroes battle the robot as Galactus continues to put his world-eating machine together. The robot, which is about three times the size of the heroes, commences to throw in a beat down on them and at one point barfs up a big load of goop that paralyzes a few of them. But Captain America isn't called the star-spangled man with the plan for nothing. He distracts the robot while the thing pulls its arms behind its back, musing that it's good the robot doesn't watch wrestling, otherwise it would know how to get out of that particular hold. As the robot is temporarily immobilized by the thing, the human torch flies in and blasts white-hot fire down its throat, while still managing to throw an insult at Ben by calling him armpit breath, proving that even when acting the hero, he's still a bit of an a-hole. Cap's plan works, however, and the robot's cybernetic digestive system is melted and blown out. But the heroes don't have time to celebrate because it's at that moment that the villains strike. They're causing all kinds of chaos and giving the heroes what for, as Doom, not that far away, sits in some sort of vehicle, waiting for the right opportunity to make his move. Then, as the villains are about to overpower the heroes and win the day, the X-Men show up and with Professor X in command, make short work of the villains. At one point during the battle, Storm, manipulating the weather, creates such a raging, well, storm, that for just an instant, it even catches the eye of Galactus. That instant was exactly what Doom was waiting for, and at tachyon speed, Doom rockets into the sky in his alien vehicle and manages to infiltrate the world ship. Colossus, in the meantime, is taken on Dr. Octopus along with the Wrecker and his wrecking crew. At first, he's holding his own and giving the tough guys a run for their money. But then the Wrecker gets in a lucky shot with his crowbar and smacks Colossus right in the ribs, dropping the big Russian. Before any of the others can do more damage to Colossus, Cyclops blasts him with his eye beam and the Enchantress, using her magic, gathers the villains and beats a hasty retreat. With the battle won, Professor X orders the team back into the ship. The team wants to grab up Colossus, who is gravely injured and on the ground, but the professor tells them to leave him behind, and while they aren't happy about it, the team obeys, and the X-Men are off. On the ship, Magneto berates the team for all their foolish mewling over the fate of Colossus. As far as he's concerned, the boy was injured and is of no further use to them. The professor, however, clarifies that Colossus's injuries were so severe that moving him would have made them worse. And besides, he tells them, there's a healer in the village that can help him. Leaving Colossus behind was the better option for the boy. He also explains that the team, he believes, should remain apart from Captain America and the others, that they will be more effective as a third force. Back at the village, Zashi runs to Johnny, calling his name, ignoring the injured heroes. Iron Man, checking on Colossus, tells Johnny that now is not the right time for love and asks if he can get his girlfriend to take a look at the injured. Johnny says he'll try, but in his words, who knows if she can help a mutant? I mean, they're not exactly normal humans. He's a whole different species, proving once more how much Johnny sucks. Colossus, however, refuses Zashi's help, and so she moves on to the others. Once she finishes with the others, her and Johnny start making out in front of everybody, and it's at that point that Colossus really begins to take notice of her, realizing that he finds her very attractive and that suddenly he can't picture Kitty in his mind and he wants her to stop looking at Johnny the way she is. He then cries out in pain and Zashi runs to his aid, helping the big Russian as Johnny flies away. Nearby, Reed is explaining to Captain America that it's going to take Galactus some time to complete his machine. But once he does, he's going to consume the entire planet destroying all of them in the process. Captain points out that Doom wasn't among the villains who'd attacked the village and wonders just what that rascal is up to. At that moment, inside the home of Galactus, the man of whom Captain America speaks stands awestruck, transfixed. So yeah, Doom's on the world ship and he can't quite believe his eyes. The small jump ship 
that he'd piloted to get aboard Galactus's home was so technologically advanced that even he had trouble understanding its controls. But compared to the world ship, it's but a toy. He walks around for a bit, talking out loud to himself, and with all the exclamation points, it's obvious he's thrown stealth out the window. Regardless, as he's strolling along, not a care in the world, he comes across something we can't see, something that causes him to call out, Hold! What's this? I don't know! What is it? Is it Galactus's sock drawer? Milk and cookies? A library containing the entire Stephen King collection? We don't know, because this is how the issue ends, with us lost and confused. And with our story now told, it's time for the top three things to dwell on. The top three things to dwell on are three moments in the book that I feel need to be given just a bit more thought. They might be funny moments. They might be stupid moments. They could even be moments of serious drama that make me feel a little something in my heart. Regardless, they're moments that I think are worth the time to revisit. Thing to dwell on number three, Johnny's got no game. In the opening scene, when the world ship arrives and Johnny tries to calm a freaked Zashi, she takes him into her home to do that funky mind meld thing with him so that they can share each other's memories and bond and all that. Well, his dialogue leading up to that moment is more than a little sad and a bit pathetic. Hey, where are you taking me? Your place? Uh, look, it's not that I'd mind, but this is a heck of a time to duck into the parlor for some R&R. Once in her home, she grabs that funky looking bottle. You're going to fix us both a drink? Is that it? Hey, hey, you're one fast mover, lady. If that's Pepsi Cola in that bottle, make mine a double. I could use a stiff belt about now. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe this isn't Johnny trying to smooth talk his alien girl. After all, she can't understand what he's saying. Instead, I'm beginning to realize that maybe what we're witnessing here is how Johnny reacts when he's scared. I mean, a spaceship that takes up the entire sky can unnerve just about anybody, even a member of the Fantastic Four. And it's now become obvious that when Johnny's scared, he babbles like an idiot. Because really, a good stiff belt of Pepsi Cola? Really? Come on, Johnny. Thing to dwell on number two, Doom shoots down the Enchantress. All right, so Doom has just commanded the villains to be prepared to fight and the Enchantress enters his lab or office or den or whatever you want to call it, and she asks Doom to help get her off the planet. To entice him, she offers, well, how would you like the love of a goddess for the rest of your life? Doom's answer is a simple and straightforward, I would not. Now, <laughs> I know that this is a small moment in the story, but for some reason it made me smile. Speaking of small story moments that made me smile, Thing to dwell on number one, mine's a wrecking ball. So we get this great scene in the book where Pile Driver tries to bully the Molecule Man and he winds up with his face in the mud. But there's this moment that's more of a background line that I think wins the issue. See, the Absorbing Man and Thunderball both carry these balls and chains weapons things that they have. And Jim Shooter added this moment where... As the Molecule Man and Volcana are walking through the garden, the Absorbing Man and Thunderball are talking about the similarity in their choice of weapons. The Absorbing Man is telling Thunderball, Yeah, after I busted a couple of guards' heads, they give me this sucker to slow me down, but I just turned around and used it on them. Thunderball's response is a simple, Mine's a wrecking ball. Now, as lines go, there's really nothing particularly funny about it until you begin to imagine the delivery. Because for me, when I read the line, Thunderball's voice in my head was probably not what Jim Shooter had intended. To me, he's saying, mine's a wrecking ball, which for me <laughs> changes his motivation in this scene because suddenly he's just this super excited little kid that's all kinds of pumped to be talking shop. Anyway, I found it funny. And those were the top three things to dwell on. 
So now we come to that time in the show where I wrap it all up and tell you how I feel about the book in general. First, with the X-Men splitting off as a third force, we got to see a little more action from the likes of Rogue and Nightcrawler, which was pretty cool. But for now, as far as the X-Men are concerned, Colossus seems to be the one that is front and center. Mr. Shooter, I call him Jim, he seems to be dialing in on some kind of possible love triangle between Johnny, Zashi, and Colossus. I mean, it's just hinted at in this issue, but that's kind of where we're heading. Also, and maybe it's just my lack of smarts, but where was the fourth army? The issue is called the Battle of Four Armies, but I only counted three. I looked up the definition of army online, and one of the definitions is an organized military force equipped for fighting on land. This is the only definition that fit what happened in this book. So using that definition loosely, Captain America and his team is Army 1. The X-Men are Army 2. The villains are Army number 3. So where was Army 4? Are they trying to tell us that the robot that Galactus sent was army number four? Is the robot like a one-man army? All right, I know I'm nitpicking, but when I read a title like that, I'm thinking of the end of The Hobbit, which is fairly grand. And that's not at all what we got with this issue. Regardless, I'm still having a lot of fun with this book. We got another Bob Layton drawn issue, which is fine. I've just never been happy with the change of artists in the middle of the series. And I've always wished they could have just stuck with the one artist, but they didn't. I get it. So I don't know why I'm crying about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Instead, I'm just going to ask you to join us back here next time as we hit the midway point of the series and we try to answer the question, where the heck are the wasp and the lizard? I mean, has anybody noticed that they've been missing? That's coming at you next week when we look at issue number six. A little death. That uh, that sounds a bit ominous, doesn't it? A little bit. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Event or Else. Questions and comments can be directed to eventorelse at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can help to boost our presence online by leaving a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. I also invite you to join our subscription program, Stephen or Else Beyond. And in return, you'll get episodes of Event or Else along with every other podcast under the Stephen or Else umbrella, early and ad-free. Check out the link in the show notes or just go to eventorelse.com to join today. Event or Else is a presentation of Stephen or Else Media. For more nerdy content just like this, check out stephenorelse.com. I don't think I can move through life knowing that a guy named Steven did this to me. How could you let this happen, Steven? Your podcast sucks. What's the next event?